humor and loves us. And that's why we can joke and laugh. Isn't that why God gave us a sense of humor? Our God is a gracious God. So in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Let's begin our opening worship song, number 912, Christ is our Father. here for a minute. Ron, uh, I saw you on there before. Uh, I muted you because we were singing our worship hymn. Um, you can unmute yourself whenever you can see the uh, oh, I see command there again. to do it. Otherwise, we're going to go back and continue on with our worship. All right, let's responsibly read the introit for this morning. You read the yellow part, I read the white part. The Lord lifts up the humble. He casts the wicked to the ground. Praise, praise the Lord, for it is good, good to sing praise praises to our God, God for it is pleasant, and a song of praise is fitting. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the outcasts of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He determines the number of stars. He gives to all of them their names. Great is our Lord and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. The Lord lifts up the humble. He casts the wicked to the ground. We pray now the collective prayers of the church. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come and worship you and to study your word. We thank you for innumerable numbers of gifts that you have given us in our lives. For the ability to laugh and, and joke and have a light. in this world. Thank you for all those gifts and the faith that assures us of all these things, even when it doesn't feel like that in our lives. Heavenly Father, we give you thanksgiving uh, that Carrie was able to safely move all of her mom's stuff back home. Help them as they continue now to sort through things and put things where they belong. Be with all those near Oscoda where the wildfire is burning. We ask that you would be with the 
firemen who are trying to put it out, that they would be successful in that. Lord, use your hand, work through whatever means to uh, extinguish that fire and to protect people's property. Be with all of those associated with us uh, and that we know that are having health difficulties, especially those who are having reactions to the second COVID shot, and as well as those that are in the hospital now suffering from COVID. We ask that you would work in whatever way that you see fit through health and medicine uh, to ease the pressure on the hospitals right now with all of the cases uh, and those that are in there that you would provide health and healing for them and be with family members who can't be with them and are worried about them. Be especially with the first responders, the doctors and the nurses who are working. Grant them strength and health. Uh, work through them, Lord. Be the power behind their healing that they provide. Be with our brother John as he is on maneuvers for the National Guard. Keep him safe and bring him safely back to us. Be with all of those uh, in our midst who are recovering from surgery, including Karen Bergeron, Rita, Dallas, Dale Norrington, and Ron. Be with these people and provide them with complete healing and health so they can return to their vocations and be with them and grant them patience as they heal. Be with our dear sister, Grandma Jones, who is suffering from kidney failure and is, well, Lord, we understand it. You might be preparing to take her. Whatever your will is, Lord, we ask that it would be done gracious and lovingly. If you choose to take her, take her quickly. Uh, if you choose to heal her, then uh, extend her life and grant her hope and continue faith in her. Be with uh, the LWML and they rally the same day. And also with uh, the convention that you would make this a successful rally and that the LWML would be lifted up and, and be able to continue their ministry in this church. And finally, Lord, we ask that you grant help and healing to me with my foot, whatever other problems I'm going through spiritually and physically, uh, that I can better serve this church as your under shepherd that you have called here. Lord, all these things we entrust over to you, trusting your great love and mercy for each of us, and all God's people respond. Amen. Amen. Pray the collect of the day. Almighty God. You exalted your son to the place of all honor and authority. Enlighten our minds by your Holy Spirit, that confessing Jesus as Lord, we may be led into all truth. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. All God's people respond. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you for that uh, little interpretation of what that noise was. <laughs> I, I, was chill. I, I was worried it was Ron. <laughs> Ron, everything okay there with you? Can you hear us? Wait if you can hear us, Ron. <laughs> oh, hi. Oh, hi. <laughs> I think we're going to mute him for right now. And, uh, we are on day three in our study guide, and uh, we're going to be reading through Matthew 21, starting at verse 23 and working through to Matthew 22, 14. As we read through it in our Bibles, we're going to take little chunks at a time. Um, now, I, I don't like to editorialize on the guys that put the study together. They, it's a big job. But as I'm looking through day three, I mean, you've got to split this. There is a ton of stuff to study. And so we're going to watch the video for the whole entire thing, but we are going to, when we read in our Bibles, we're going to take little chunks at a time and work through it. Um, this is all really good stuff, and it is kind of interconnected, but man, man, oh man, it's a heavy chapter. Doreen, I think you picked a good day to come. Uh, this is all, not that any other day wouldn't be, but this is all real good stuff. Something so, you need to do, I guess. Something we all need to hear. So anyway, let's see if I can get it going uh, with our video first, and then we'll start reading through the uh, scripture. Jesus entered the temple courts, and while he was teaching, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him. By what authority are you doing these things, they asked. And who gave you this authority? 
Jesus replied, I will also ask you one question. If you answer me, I will tell you by what authority I am doing these things. John's baptism, where did it come from? Was it from heaven or of human origin? They discussed it among themselves and said, if we say from heaven, he will ask, then why didn't you believe him? But if we say of human origin, we are afraid of the people, for they all hold that John was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we don't know. Then he said, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. What do you think? There was a man who had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go and work today in the vineyard. I will not, he answered. But later, he changed his mind and went. Then the father went to the other son and said the same thing. He answered, I will, sir, but he did not go. Which of the two did what his father wanted? The first, they answered. Jesus said to them, truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you to show you the way of righteousness and you did not believe him, but the tax collectors and the prostitutes did. And even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe him. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and moved to another place. When the harvest time approached, he sent his servants to the tenants to collect his fruit. The tenants seized his servants. They beat one, killed another, and stoned a third. Then he sent other servants to them, more than the first time, and the tenants treated them the same way. Last of all, he sent his son to them. They will respect my son, he said. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to each other, this is the heir, come. Let's kill him and take his inheritance. So they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? He will bring those wretches to a wretched end, they replied, and he will rent the vineyard to other tenants who will give him his share of the crop at harvest time. Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. Anyone who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. Anyone on whom it falls will be crushed. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard Jesus' parables, they knew he was talking about them. They looked for a way to arrest him, but they were afraid of the crowd because the people held that he was a prophet. Jesus spoke to them again in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. Then he sent some more servants and said, Tell those who have been invited that I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fattened cattle have been butchered and everything is ready. 
come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his field, another to his business. The rest seized his servants, mistreated them and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, the wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited did not deserve to come. So go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you find. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find, the bad as well as the good, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. He asked, how did you get in here without wedding clothes, friend? The man was speechless. Then the king told the attendants, tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are invited, but few are chosen. Okay. Ron, whether you can tell or not, your uh, your videos on. Okay. Let's turn to our Bibles now, and uh, let's read just one section of this. You see what I mean? This is packed full. It's a lot of stuff. Anyway, we'll uh, chug through it. Um, let's read uh, to begin with Matthew 21, uh, verses uh, 23 through 27. And when he entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came up to him as he was teaching and said, by what authority are you doing these things, and who gave you this authority? Jesus answered them, I also will ask you one question, and if you tell me the answer, then I also will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, from where did it come? From heaven or from man? And they discussed it among themselves, saying, if we say from heaven, he will say to us, why then did you not believe him? But if we say from man, we are afraid of the crowd, for they all hold that John was a prophet. So they answered, we do not know, and neither will I tell you by what authority I do. Okay. So we have the uh, people in charge of the temple, the religious leaders approach Jesus. Why, why are they questioning his authority? Does anybody remember what happened the previous day when Jesus entered the temple? That's when he overturned the tables. Yeah, he cleared it. And we learned that uh, those people there that were exchanging money and uh, exchanging animals, who, who was behind all that? Who controlled the, the religious leaders, the chief yeah. priests, and maybe some of the scribes? Pharisees too, but uh, mainly it was those in charge. We can't see you, but we can hear them too. Yeah, we can, we can hear you guys when you whisper. Uh, I'm caring to see it all. Anyway, uh, so they didn't like it because Jesus is throwing a monkey wrench into how things operate. They were good Lutherans. They don't like change. This is the way we do things. Unfortunately, Jesus being the son of God, the very God who belongs in that temple, realizes this is wrong. This is very wrong. It's the court of the Gentiles. It's the place for non-Jews to come and worship. And besides that, the animals smell and stink and defecate. And there's noise, and this has no place uh, in a worship. The, the whole thing of what they were doing, the exchanging of coins and the exchanging of animals, was actually a needed thing, just not in the temple. It could have been outside. It could have been outside, but if it's outside, the have, and they can't get their money. they're not they're able to monopolize money. on it. So um, God's house was being ruined, and uh, the ones that were being accused of robbers okay. by yeah. Chief I don't think I can hear you, but. But Jesus answers how? How does Jesus? 
They were Jesus' way to do things. So we just gotta get something to catch candy. Oh yeah, that's dumb. Hoping to get some kind of an answer. Yeah. You notice that Jesus has a great way of doing that. You ask him a question and he in turn asks you a question, not to divert. I mean, this is how we should not use this in certain ways, but it's not for that. He wants you to consider the answer. Does he know the answer? Oh, yeah. He's God. He knows all things. He wants you to come to the answer. And that's a kind of a way we were taught to leave an adult Bible study. I encourage you to come up with the answer, as opposed to me making a Bible study a lecture where you just sit and passively listen. Get your thoughts turned. And Jesus is very good at that. Now, his, his direction here in the question is he, the, the Pharisees and the, and the Sadducees and the chief priests do this. They come with questions to try to trip Jesus up that he can't answer. Do you think Jesus is necessarily doing that? Has he changed the subject here? With the question he asked them, it kind of and on the surface seems unrelated, doesn't it? At first, it did to me. Uh, yeah. uh, we, I, I didn't piece it together until later on. Just, just so you know, uh, Karen and Ron, I muted you again. When you get everything situated, go ahead and unmute, but we can we can hear you as, as you whisper, and it's uh, we can hear you really well. <laughs> so, don't mean to be rude, but uh, just trying to make things a little more personable for you. Let's, uh, let's look at a couple of the verses here that uh, uh, they talk about in our study guide. It says, um, note the same question that Jesus uh, was put to Jesus by the chief priest uh, was asked of John the Baptist in John 1 and of Jesus earlier in his ministry. So we're going to take a look at, at both of those occurrences. First of all, uh, when John the Baptist was asked in John 1, we're going to do 19 to 27. If somebody wants to read that on the screen, that would be fantastic. And this is the testimony of John. When the Jews sent priests and, the Le and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? He said, no, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, no. So they said to him, who are you? We need to give an, we need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now, they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him, then why are you baptizing if neither of, if you are neither the Christ nor Elijah nor the prophet? John answered them, I baptize with water, but among. Sorry. <laughs> oh, where am I now? I don't know. I think he jumped. At 26. I'm at 26. Oh, okay. Thanks. I baptize oh. with water, but among you stands one. You do not know. Even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. So sent by the Pharisees, and they're questioning John the Baptist, and they're asking him the same question, aren't they? By what authority are you doing these things? And what was John doing? He was baptizing. Baptizing, baptizing who? The people. Just the Jews? No, no, everyone. Yeah. There were Roman soldiers that showed up. And we read one of the other gospel accounts. And um, this baptism was for the repentance of, sin. of sins. Now, the Pharisees, are they going to think they need that baptism? No. no. Did they not have any baptism until this point? They did. Um, they, they would baptize things. They would wash in utensils and couches and things like that to make them holy. But also, if you were a non-Jew and you wanted to become a Jew, that was one of the ways, was a baptism. You were baptized into the Jewish faith, if, even if you uh, racially were not a Jew. So it, it was around. I, that. I don't think I knew that about the, uh, I knew the purification, but I did yeah. not know that. Yeah, baptism did exist. And, but it was, this is for a repentance of sins. The Pharisees think they need to repent? 
Well, they were going under the rules of the law and keeping them perfectly. So they were, they were in a different zone. Yeah. You're asking me, a Pharisee, to repent? You guys maybe need to repent, but not us. If you're a good Jew, even if you're not a Pharisee, you're supposed to follow the law. And then there's those people that don't follow the law, like the tax collectors, the prostitutes, and other quote-unquote sinners, where there's really no place in the kingdom of heaven for them. So what are you doing? Did God send you here to do this, John? That's kind of what they're asking. And, and they know messianic prophecy. And uh, they get an idea that what John is saying is connected with messianic prophecy. So they're asking him questions that have to do with who's going to appear as part of this messianic prophecy fulfillment. So the first thing they ask is, are you Elijah? And he answers, no, no. But wait a minute. Wait a minute. Jesus, a couple times, like right after the Mount of Transfiguration, told the disciples that John was the Elijah to come. The next question is, nor the prophet. So did they Let's go back. Let's stick on Elijah Elijah. first, though. So what's going on here? Why do you think John would say no when Jesus is saying yes? Because it isn't that he was the person of Elijah, but he was the mouthpiece of what Elijah had proclaimed in the Old Testament. Yeah. What happened to Elijah? How did he leave this world? He was taken to heaven on a fiery chariot. So he didn't die, did he? No. So therefore, if I'm a Jew, and I know this because I've learned it, he could actually appear in the body again because he didn't die. So what do you think these guys, when they say, are you Elijah, what are they insinuating or thinking? That he was indeed Elijah returned. In the flesh, reappeared. It would almost be kind of a reincarnation kind of thing. So John correctly answered, no. Led by the Holy Spirit, he knew what they were asking. Jesus, on the other hand, is speaking of messianic prophecy, and he is the Old Testament prophet John was to come that would prepare the way for him. And so in that, he did go the Elijah. There's context. The disciples knew what they were asking, and Jesus knew where their minds were, and John did here. So he said, no, well, let's go with the prophet one. What was your question on the prophet thing, well, baby? Who, who is the prophet? I mean, Elijah was a prophet, mm -hmm. and they already covered Christ being mm -hmm. the Son of God. So who's the prophet? Moses promised before he died that one would come from their midst who would be like him, would be a mediator between the people and God, and would be the spokesman, a great prophet. And uh, the immediate fulfillment of that was kind of um, Joshua but not fully. The one that Moses was talking about was most completely answered in Christ. Yeah, a Jew. So it, so Christ and the prophet are the same person, in a sense. In a sense. Well, and, and, right. is, is, is John the Baptist that figure? No. It's kind of what they asked the first time, are you the Christ? And thankfully, John the Baptist said no. <laughs> I am not. I'm not worthy to untie his sandals, by the way. <laughs> what was that, Tom? You can say. Oh, the three persons. He fulfills all. Yep, you have Moses giving us a partial prophecy of, of Jesus. It was all a progressive revelation because actually it's not something you can deliver to everybody all at once. And it came over a number of years. God slowly revealed it. And part of that is just the grandeur of the sea. So anyway, he is not those. Uh, and then well, what does he say? Hey, you're neither Christ, Elijah, or the prophet. So who the heck are you? Meaning, you aren't supposed to be here doing this at all, are you? And John answers them in verse 26. Um, is that? Yep. And that's Messianic. He is the way preparer. And they didn't get that. And he baptizes with water, but among you stands one whom you do not know. And who is he speaking of there? Christ. Christ. Good. Uh, and then Jesus was asked that uh, same question in John 2. Somebody want to read these verses in John 2? 
Uh, it'll be 18 to 22. Well, the what sign do you show us for doing these things? He answered them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Jews then said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days? Continue on. But he was, he was speaking about the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. So this comes from John's account of the temple cleansing. And we talked last week, there's some debate among Bible scholars. Is John just another view of the cleansing of the temple that we have in Matthew? Or is a different one, and there's things to weigh on both sides of it. It is conceivable that Jesus cleansed the temple twice. In fact, it would be very apropos. The first one in John seems to be at the beginning of his ministry. When he first began his public ministry, his first visit on Passover, he cleanses the temple. And on his last visit before his death, he takes care of it again. And there'd been a couple of years hence. So they maybe wouldn't necessarily be expecting him to come in and do it because everybody seems to be a bit surprised. But as one of you said, when we studied the temple cleansing uh, last week, you aren't gonna stop him. This was not the time to be arrested. Jesus would choose the time when he would give himself over to the authorities. Otherwise he will act and do what's in his authority to do it according to the will of God and the plan of God. So we don't know, but this is from uh, John's uh, version of that. And so they do at that time ask Jesus, by what authority you do these things? We run the temple. We're in charge of these cells and stuff. What the heck do you think you're doing? And Jesus answers them by saying, destroy this temple and in three days, I will raise it up. What's he talking about? His resurrection. His yeah. body. Because what is his body? His temple. The temple. Is it more of a temple than the temple in Jerusalem? Yes. Yes. There's evidence that when they rebuilt the temple in Jerusalem, not evidence, but were some, when you read the rebuilding of the temple by the exiles when they returned from Babylon, it never talks about the glory of God returning to the uh, Holy of Holies. It never talks about the Ark of the Covenant appearing. The last time we hear the Ark of the Covenant is before Babylon comes and destroys the temple and it just disappears. And you can watch, there's National Degree of Geographic Studies some people think it's in Ethiopia. Some people think it's hid out in the hills, maybe where the uh, Dead Scrolls were found in a cave somewhere out in the wilderness. Uh, I'll tell you it's gone, and I don't think we're ever gonna find it. Um, if we do see it again, it's gonna be an eternal life. But um, without the Ark of the Covenant there, and that's where the glory of God rested over the Ark of the Covenant and the Holy of Holies, we don't know that his physical manifestation of his glory ever returned to the temple. But guess what? When Jesus walked in, what do you now have in that temple in Jerusalem? The glory and power and divinity of God encased in flesh, and he has returned. And that's why he can say what goes on in that temple. But the temple is really no longer the dwelling place of God. Jesus came down, and in John 2, it talks about, uh, actually, if you translate it right, he tabernacled with us and tabernacle is the is the description of a tent that the, the israelites used in the wilderness when they wandered in the wilderness and that was where god manifested himself among them well guess what jesus came down god the son in human form to tabernacle with people in a personal way that goes beyond what he ever did before so destroy this temple and if he rebuilds it in three days, what does that tell you about his authority? Well, it's greater than the people that were run in the temple. It's greater than the temple itself, isn't it? He has authority over all things. Yeah. And by his resurrection, he proves that, doesn't he? Yeah. So, when Jesus is talking to them and uh, the question he asked them, uh, which is, I will also ask you a question, and if you tell me the answer, I will also tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, where did it come from, from heaven or from man? And it talks about 
the reason why they struggle to answer. If they say it was from heaven, he will say, why didn't you get baptized? And if you say it's from man, well, the crowd would stone. And why does Jesus now bring this up in regards to everything else we've learned about authority? Who was John baptizing by? Who actually is the authority of Christ, right? Christ in the flesh. He's all part of that. And so if they would recognize that John the Baptist was baptizing with the authority of God, and John is the way preparer for who? Christ. Christ, you have to say, by what authority does he do this? He's the Messiah. He's the king. He's the king who has come to save us. And they will not recognize that. And they will not go there. Well, that's because they wanted him to come to glory and get rid of all the Romans. Yeah. They wanted him to be the Messiah that they wanted, right? Yeah. So if they won't recognize John, even if Jesus testifies, by what authority do I do this? I'm a Christ. Matter of fact, I'm God in human form. Are they going to accept that? No. That's why he asks. You have to be able to confess this first. You have to have faith in the fulfillment of messianic prophecy to understand who I am. So it's not just a misdirection. It's a great question. And Jesus knew they would stumble over it. Is he doing this just to make fun of them, you think? Is he picking on them? No. No. Yeah, I think he's doing it to challenge them. Mm -hmm. Challenge them with what end? To realize who he really is, not just someone turning the tables over, not just the man turning the tables over. To do what his uh, original message, the basic message he came to preach is, repent and believe. That's what he wants from them, too. Yeah. It's not just to pick on them or make fun of them. That's what he wants. Good. Uh, I'm going to tell you again, uh, Ron, I unmuted you, or I, I muted you because there's a lot of noise going on. I'm going to ask you to unmute. And if you can turn your camera on, it would be, it'd be great to see you. I think, wouldn't it? Do you guys want to see Ron? No. <laughs> well, maybe. <sighs> Got some more work to do with you guys. <laughs> All right. Anyway, let's turn back to our uh, study. 10A. Read verses 28 to 32. That's uh, under my Bible, the parable of the two sons. Somebody want to read that section of scripture? 28 to 32. What do you think? A man had two sons, and he went to the first and said, Son, go and work in the vineyard today. And he answered, I will not. But afterwards, he changed his mind and went. And he went to Oldham's son and said the same. And he answered, I go, sir, but he did not. Oh. Which of the two did the will of the Father? They said, The first. Jesus said to them, Truly, I say to you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes, go into the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and he did not believe him, but the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even when you saw it, you did not afterwards change your mind and believe him. Verse 29, the one son answered, I will not, but afterward he changed his mind and went. Changed his mind. What are we talking about spiritually when you change your mind? Repent. He repented. Key, key to this parable. Because Jesus is saying this parable after what's just happened. His authority is challenged mm -hmm. by the Pharisees and the scribes and religious leaders, and they didn't recognize his authority. So this whole parable is aimed at them and us as well. But them changed his mind. Because Jesus then goes on to say, and when you saw it, you did not afterward change your minds. And believe. You did not repent of your sins and believe in me as I've clearly demonstrated that I am by what I teach and what I do. Going back to our study guide, uh, in the parable of the two sons, what do you understand the following to represent? And the first is the father, 
And I'll put the verses up, but I, I'm betting you guys could probably answer that without me putting the verses up. Who is the father in the parable? God. What's that? Yeah. Yeah. We're asked to read Luke 10, 1 to 2. So uh, somebody want to read that on the screen? After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them on ahead of him, two by two, into every town and place where he himself was about to go. And he said to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. So here in this parable, the sons are going out to work where? In the vineyard. In the vineyard. And uh, we know this is a parable, so this didn't actually happen. It's a story that's to relate to spiritual truths to today. And in here, Jesus talks about evangelism as being the harvest. And who sends people out to be the harvesters? He does. In the parable? Jesus himself. Yep, the Lord of the harvest, which is also God. So the Father in the parable is actually, well, it could be Jesus, but it's God the Father. The Trinity. Pick a member. <laughs> okay, and then the son who refused and then obeyed. We're asked to read Matthew 21, 31 to 32. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said the first. Jesus said to them, truly, I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes go into the kingdom of God before you. So who are those that obeyed, at first said no, and then obeyed? The tax collectors and the prostitutes. Mm -hmm. Because what did they do? The, 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 God's word in the very beginning, from the get go. The, the, the second son had a change of mind or a change of heart. And, and what's happened? Why are these clearly sinful, evil people, tax collectors and prostitutes, why are they now welcomed into the kingdom? What has happened to them? Because they repented. They repented change of heart, a change of mind. And, and who caused that? The Holy, Holy Spirit. Spirit. Are you sure they didn't just decide? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm in the wrong denomination. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's the work of Christ. I mean, that's the message he came to preach. Repent and believe the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And think of kingdom of heaven, not only just as a king, temporal kingdom with a king on a throne, the reign and rule of God. And, and for you, where is God reigning and ruling for you right now? In our heart. Yeah. In our life. Yes. By the Holy Spirit and the faith he creates. And so when Jesus says the reign and rule of God is at hand, he's bringing it through the gospel when faith is created in their heart. Now, Pentecost we have is the big holiday when the Holy Spirit makes what some people think is his magical first appearance. He's been at work. He's been at work this whole time. Pentecost he manifests himself in people's lives in a way he never has before for a reason and a purpose he never has before. But he's, wherever you have one member of the Trinity, you got the other two. He's done that work. Well, the proof for that is at the baptism of Jesus, because all three persons of the Godhead are there. But kind of cost the Pentecost, the, the tongues of fire that were on the top of the people's head. I baptized with Sorry. water. Yeah. But the one who is coming will baptize with fire. That wasn't going to happen right away, was it? That was, no. coming. that was coming. Good. So that's who the sons who refused and then obeyed. So, okay, who's the son who agreed but did not go? And we're asked to read Matthew 21, verse 23. And when they entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came up as he was teaching and said, by what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? And then also um, 31 to 32, where Jesus says, um, I'm just going to read, uh, truly I say to you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes go into the kingdom before you. For John came to you. Who's the you that John the Baptist came to? And you did in a way of righteousness and you did not believe in him. 
Well, theoretically, he's talking to the quote, the chosen people. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But, but especially the Pharisees. Yeah. The, the, the religious Jews. leaders who refused to believe that what John was doing was from God. And so who are the who are the ones who are the sons that agreed but did not go? The Pharisees. The religious leaders. Yes. And the Pharisees and, and, and the chosen people of the Jews. How did they agree but not go? What did they agree to? Think of what their vocation is. Oh, we know these are or excuse me. We know God the Father. Mm -hmm. We just we just are not going to accept the Son. Not only do we know God the Father, but what's our relationship with God the Father? Everything that they do. Perfect obedience, right? Yeah. But they didn't have perfect obedience. We know Yahweh obedience. loves us because we obey. In fact, we not only obey the Ten Commandments, we've created laws around them that when we keep them, it makes us obey them perfectly. But what about the heart and the mind? It ain't happening there with them, is it? And it's not really happening with the hands either. No. Because what have they allowed in the temple? <laughs> not exactly anything that's in obedience to God. Only in their minds. Well, in their minds, based on what we've been reading, did they really need a Savior? You mentioned they set up the rules, they obeyed the rules, were the chosen people, end of story. So, yeah. They, they didn't need a spiritual savior, did no, they? No, they, they, in their own evolution of their church, the result of the issue, they, they, they set up the laws, they kept the laws. They needed somebody to clean the Romans out mm -hmm. yeah. so they could rebuild the temporal kingdom of Israel and all of its glory. Do this for us. Mm -hmm. This we can't do. But as far as, well, that's why you're here, Jesus. That's why, if, if you were the Messiah, that's why God sent you, because we've been such obedient people. And that really is the Jewish mindset. And, and if you attend or Zoom the Bible study tonight, we're gonna the person we're gonna study is a former Jew. It's still the mindset today. They're God's chosen people because they've been so obedient. He loves them because of who they are as Jews. And uh, grace is not there. They don't need grace. Grace is a dirty word. You earn everything that you have. They've earned the love of God by their keeping. And that's still true today. And it was true back then. They haven't changed. Well, they're following the same rules as back then. The Orthodox, yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. Now here's the here's the take-home question right here. How might you be like each of the two sons? There's a lot of times I say no and then it's just like is that a good thing? Well. Yeah, maybe not a good thing to say no to begin with, but it's not a bad thing to change your mind. In faith, that's because you're struggling, as we all are, with our old Adam. There's that struggle that goes on where, no, I don't want to do <laughs> we're, we're like Joan, no, I want to go the other way. I don't want to do that. I can remember it's a struggle. years ago, at my previous church, we didn't have a custodian. And so if you were on altar bill, you, and it was a huge thing to do. We were expected to go in once a week, and not just clean the altar and put communion out, but we had to we had to clean the whole sanctuary, the bathrooms, the I mean everything. It was a big job. And I I'm thinking I've got young kids at home. They were in elementary school. I was working part time, and I'm thinking my house is a mess, and I'm here spending out, you know, and I get that real negative attitude. Like, why am I here when there's other people that could be doing this and don't? And that, 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 you know, how your mind plays. And then I'd, then I'd remember, well, you know, Christ did a lot of things he didn't want to do, and mainly dying on the cross. He didn't want to go through all that pain. And he, he prayed. He prayed, and he prayed, and he sweated, and blood, take this cup from me, if it's your will. But don't do my will, your, yours, Lord. So then I, like... Faith, get over it. <laughs> this on, is nothing compared to that. He's not asking me to do that. Put on your big girl pants. Yeah. And, and they were big pants. Stop your whining. <laughs> it, it, it's, it, it really is a good thing because if Al said, let's be honest, we say no all the time. And we may not even realize it. We say no when we say, "Our my will, not yours. And uh, sometimes we do that 
on the surface. We know what God wants us to do, but other times it's, we don't even realize it. Well, it's just like becoming a trustee the first time they asked me. I'm like, I've been asking a couple of times. I'm like, no. Oh. And then when nobody stepped up, I'm like, yeah. I'll do it. <laughs> we're, we're called to love one another. How? With what kind of love? Unconditional. Mm -hmm. So we know that. But, but how does that play out in your life? And this is where you kind of get those sins of omission. It, it means that I need to set aside my time, talents, and treasure, which means the schedule, and I have a schedule, I use Google uh, Calendar. Is that really mine? How firm are those things that I put in Google Calendar for my day? Not very. Why? Who gets to override them? God. I don't, I don't know that. what's going to happen. Some, something can happen to change it. I don't want it's that. like you might have a doctor's appointment and they'll say, oh, the doctor's sick and they'll call and cancel that. Now, there's, there's certain things that might overrule others. If I have an appointment to visit somebody in a, in a nursing home and I need to be there at a certain time, uh, it wouldn't be, I need to make a value choice. Do I stop and talk to this person or do I try to make it later, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you definitely want me in there up at the altar at 10 o'clock, right? No, no. <laughs> All right, fine. <laughs> but, uh, you know, there's, there's choices that I make at times that are sometimes in keeping with this idea of, you know, two, I'm supposed to love all of you, not one. So if I'm 15 minutes late just to have a conversation with Faith, am I loving you guys in the sanctuary? Who are waiting for worship? Not no. really. So we, we do have, you do have, we do have choices to make. And the problem is that we don't always use the God-given wisdom because I don't have it. I only receive that wisdom from him. Otherwise, it doesn't normally exist in my head. And that unconditional love doesn't exist normally in my heart. It has to come from him. It's not a natural part of me anymore. It was, but thanks to the fall, it's gone. So yeah, we, we do, it is a really good right and salutary thing to change our minds. We need to do that all the time. Well, in a way, it isn't changing your mind like over a pen. It is. And, and do I do that? Do I sit down and go, hey, you know what? That wasn't right. Who's behind that realization that I need to have a change? And what does he use to show me that? I think he uses God's word. Yes. Kind of a claw. Or what? A claw. Mm -hmm. Well, in the respect that I couldn't hear what you said. A clock. A clock, yeah. 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 Or a calendar. Yeah. Or just the person in front of me. Yeah, he, he does work through <clears throat> scripture. But not just work through scripture. We, we have this thing I brought up before. It's called the law and preached. And it's uh, troubles that come my way that turn me back to him and back to his word when I start to stray. Uh, do I need to read something that morning to be convicted? Can I read something a week prior and then end up be happy? Because his word is living and active in me, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> From the time our female deacons are starting to come up. And I know that for myself, I was in the church, but really stressed through as a mission. And learning the ways that I was away from the church, away from God, that never left. Absolutely. Another good example of that is like my grandmother, who when she broke her hip and they went, I think she was like 100, she was in the hospital. And they, they went up to give her communion. She still, because we do the same liturgies and the same song, she knew all of that, even though she suffered tremendously from dementia. She probably didn't know who I was or who the pastor was, but she knew that. There are those things to food, there was prayer. Exactly. Uh, yeah, those are a really good example of things that are material by people who do that. One of my uh, seminary professors back when he was in the parish talked about visiting this elderly man in a nursing home. And uh, he had grew up in Germany and had worshiped in German. He knew English, but growing up, they did the liturgy in German. And he was debating on whether to give this man communion because if they can't really recognize the body and blood, in other words, if they aren't mentally with it enough, you really shouldn't give them communion because mm -hmm. their faith is fine without it. 
But he said, I kind of said a quick prayer and I started. He said, this man started to respond in German. He remembered it. Struggled to communicate otherwise, but the words that came through were clear and crystal and correct. Maybe. Another thing you can do is you can have a yellow legal pad at home and you can write questions on it. I don't know of anybody that really does that. Do you, Joe? Uh, maybe. <laughs> That's a good, that's a great thing. It's a great thing. So that's how we're like the one son that changed his mind. How are we like the son that says, yes, I will, but won't? Do, do we sometimes make promises that we don't keep? Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. All the time. Do we make promises to God and yes. don't keep them? If you get me through this, I'll never, I'll go to church every Sunday. I'll be, you know, of course, that you don't do that. Lord, I know I'm supposed to forgive this person, so I forgive them. And then the next time they open their mouth, what happens to that? <laughs> Which turns us back to the other thing. Why do we need to have, keep having this change of mind and heart? That's what. But that's life, isn't it? And the great thing about it is even though I keep stumbling and failing, if I was to die right now, where am I going to be? In heaven. Yeah. yeah. I might have missed the chance to repent, but I'm in a repentant relationship through my baptism. Yeah. I, I remember who I am without him, and I confess by faith I know who I am with him. And that isn't that a wonderful, wonderful, secure feeling to have? Can you imagine somebody that lives with a thought of like a Jew, where it's all based on works, and you get to the end of your life, and what if you are one work shy of giving in? And you never know for sure that you're saved because you never know if you did it. In, in the Catholic Church, when it, when it all depended on having a private confession, what if you didn't get that in? What if the priest couldn't make it for final for last rites? Am I going to heaven? I don't well, know. You always have those relatives that are praying for those extra prayers to get you. Well, that's, that's to get you closer to heaven, but you don't get to heaven anyway. So how do I get to purgatory? How do I know I'm going to get out of purgatory? What if my you relatives don't? A, what if they don't have enough of those services? And if you don't have enough family to pray for generations to come, I don't know. Yeah. That's kind of a scary thought. It is. I wonder if I can't get through it. My extended family probably would pray. My family. The uh, question 11, how does a self-righteous attitude amount to a refusal to follow God's way of righteousness? What's a self-righteous attitude? I'm better than him because... I go to church. I go to church. I'm, I'm an elder. Communion this Sunday. I went to Bible class on Wednesday morning. That is true. You are better because of the Bible class, especially this one right here. That's true. <laughs> So self-righteousness is like more like a works righteousness. In the Pharisees that Christ is dealing with no different in the story. It's also like my life. Yeah. 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 Who's the God? You're putting your face in. And if, if I don't completely on the surface recognize myself as God, who's who's deciding what righteousness is? Who's deciding what it takes to be righteous? Well, I am based on uh, um, my my values of right and wrong. And whose job is that really? Hey. Yeah. yeah, the creator. He's the, oh, all right. he, he's the one that tells us how we should live our lives, right? He created them and created the whole world. These are, you know, what are the commandments? These are the rules you live by. This is the operating manual for being human. This is what it means. And he had to give that to us. Well, Adam knew all that before he fell. And when he fell, all that knowledge, that connection with God left. And now God had to tell us how we should live because we no longer had his wisdom or his grace. We no longer had that connection. And our heart doesn't want to hear it, does it? Are there a lot of self-righteous people today? Yeah. yeah. I think sometimes I'm not, sometimes I think I can be self-righteous in my thoughts. Mm -hmm. You want us to call you? <laughs> well, he just did. <laughs> I think he needs to move on. If he knows <laughs> Let's move on. Yeah. 
let's let's read Philippians 3, 8, 8 9, shall we? Let's turn to God's word and save this whole thing here. Somebody, somebody want to read Philippians 3, 8, 8 9. Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having any righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. So this is Philippians. Who is writing this? Paul. How much does Paul know? How smart is he? Pretty smart. How learned was he in, in the Old Testament scriptures and in theology? Very learned. Mm -hmm. And what does he think about all that? He counts it all as loss, as rubbish. Um, <clears throat> that word rubbish can either literally be transferred either as fecal matter or menstrual cloth. It's one of the two. So how does he, how does he, what level does he put all that learning and knowledge? It's worth less than nothing especially if it counts for my righteousness, then it is like fecal matter, isn't it? It's terrible. I'm going to present this to God as the reason why he should love me and why I should get into eternal life. When all I really have to present to him is sin and hate. So what is worth? What surpasses all that? What does he find to surpass all that? Okay. A righteousness that comes through faith. In faith, he is declared to be what he could never be on his own. I am a poor, miserable sinner. I've done poor, miserable sinner things just since I woke up this morning. But I'm still declared to be in right standing by Christ. And that is something that's hard to, you can only hold that by faith. Because I know, I know me. I know what's going on in my thoughts. And yet he declares me to be that. And that's what I truly am. And that's what you truly are. And that's what you should hold by faith. He looks at you as being in right standing, no matter what you've said or thought or done. Through baptismal grace, you are declared to be in right standing. You are declared to be his precious child whom he loves. And he shows you your sin so you can change your ways. That's love. That's so you don't stray away from him. Not to punish you, not to say, I told you a number of times, Doreen, and God darn it all. It's, it's not that. It's love. And it hurts sometimes, doesn't it, when he shows our heart? It hurts. Sometimes when he shows us those sins, it hurts. But he does that out of love, just like we can lovingly discipline our children. That's done out of love, and they don't like it. I don't like to do it sometimes. <laughs> Huh? I was just going to say that, you know, I think we, we learn by example because we didn't do anything different than what our children did. And so, therefore, what do you, do? you want to, your kids to do what you, what you didn't do or what you could have done. And the other comment that I was going to make is, if, if we were going to follow an example of our righteous life, Paul would probably be one of the best examples in the Bible. Yeah. Because he, un he understood. And you can, if you read Paul, it's, it's great. Because he really understood what his relationship was. One of my favorite verses from Paul, and I keep reminding myself, is I'm to be a living sacrifice. Which doesn't mean I die on the altar. It means I live. Which means every part of my life is not my own. I sacrifice it over to him. My time, my talents, my schedule, my treasures. And so it's a life of constant sacrifice. It means I give something up. It means that at times to be a good steward for the Lord, it's going to hurt. Not temporarily hurt me and that I'm going to be in the poorhouse, but I'm going to struggle to give it up. It's going to be a challenge. And that's the Christian life. And without the Holy Spirit, I won't do it. I like my stuff. It's my stuff. This is my time. This is my life. No, it's not. 
It's his. And once again, through repentance, he keeps reminding me of that. And I see that verse in my mind. You talk about, that's one of the stuck in my mind. Be a living sacrifice, Pastor Mark. Set down your plan for today and go be a living sacrifice for your Lord. Good. Comments or questions up until now? Great little parable, isn't it? Let's read another, shall we? Let's read the parable of the tenants. So let's do uh, 33 uh, through the end of the chapter. Either that or see if the Lord would actually. I don't think he's gonna. You're not gonna push a button. Oh, no, I'm not, I'm not gonna push a button. I'll, I'll let one of you. Hear another parable. There was a master of a house who planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a wine press in it and built a tower and leased it to the tenants and went to into another country. When the season for fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the tenants to get his fruit. And the tenants took his servants and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants more than the first, and they did the same to them. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, they will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, this is the heir, come to come, let us kill him and have his inheritance. And they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. When therefore the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, he will put those wretches to a miserable death and let out the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the fruits in their seasons. Jesus said to them, have you never read the scriptures? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruits. And the one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. And when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. When the chief priests and Pharisees heard his parables, they perceived that he was speaking about them. And although they were seeking to arrest him, they feared the crowds because they held him to be a prophet. Okay. How timely is this parable for what's happening right now in Jesus' life and those around him? Mm -hmm. It's exactly what's going on. And, and it, in a way, it's also kind of the history of the Jewish people up until now. It's kind of a summation. Um, in Acts, Stephen, who's a, a, a deacon, before he's stoned, he has this wonderful moment in front of the Sanhedrin, the ruling Jewish council, where he preaches an excellent sermon and pretty much shows them the same thing. Look at your history. Look at the, what you've done whenever God tried to teach you his truth, how you react. And Jesus is kind of in a parable, an allegorical way, he's showing them this too. So we're asked to kind of go through and figure out who each person is in here. Who do you understand the following to represent? Who is the landowner who built the vineyard? God the Father. Yeah. And we can Jesus. see that if we look at Psalm uh, 80. Somebody want to read Psalm 87 to 11? Restore us, O God of hosts. Let your face shine that we may be saved. You brought a line out of Egypt. You drove out the nations and clan you cleared the ground for it it took some fruit and filled the land the mountains were covered with its shade the mighty cedars with its branches it sent us it sent out its branches to the sea and it shoots to the river good um we'll see this also from isaiah but where do you think jesus drew this parable from what do you think he had in mind Think he had the psalm in mind? Who who is the vine brought out of Egypt? Christ. Who are oh, the, the Jews? Yeah, the Israelites, right? Yeah. 
He took them out of Egypt, and where did he plant them? In the promised land. And what did they have? Did they have to rebuild cities and rebuild and plant vineyards? No, the stuff was already there. God provided it all for them. In fact, he promised, I'll chase them out. And pretty much he did. He gave them all these things. And how did they respond? Well, it was there and they didn't want to do what God told them to do the first time. That's why they wandered around for 40 years. They were supposed to produce fruit. What does it mean by fruit? What fruit were they supposed to produce? Bring more people to praise. The fruit of praise. Yeah. Right? To keep the Ten Commandments, which is love God and love one another. And they didn't do that. They were supposed to forgive one another. Uh, they were supposed to have this year of jubilee where if people had enslaved themselves because they ran short of money, after so many years, you were supposed to let them go free. They didn't do that. They weren't supposed to charge a fellow Israelite uh, interest if they borrowed money. They didn't do that. They're supposed to encourage one another in the faith. And here you have these Pharisee guys that do the exact opposite. You're not good enough for the kingdom of God. So it happened, it was, it's the Israelites, and you can see kind of a, a, a mini clearing of the vineyard when Babylon came. And when Assyria came, Assyria cleaned out the northern kingdom, and Babylon came and cleaned out the southern kingdom. And then after 70 years in exile, God brought this vine back and replanted it in the promised land. And now, where are they at? Have they learned anything from that? Are they producing any good fruits now? No. And who, well, let's continue on here. So that's... Uh, that's who the uh, the landowner is, the vineyard. And we got Isaiah 5, 7. Does somebody want to read that on the screen? Isaiah 5, 7. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judea, Judah are his pleasant, are his pleasant plantings. And he looked for justice, but behold, bloodshed for righteousness, but behold, an outcry. So this is Isaiah writing before the exile. This is the situation of the, of the vineyard. Uh, it's important that Judah is there because the rest of Israel is gone. Now it's only the one tribe of Judah combined with Benjamin that are left. And they'll be cleared out. And they were, re they were the ones that were replanted back there. And they're still not producing pleasant fruit. They're still not treating each other with justice and love. They're not. So that's the vineyard is the house of Israel, um, which would be the Jews. They're the remnant that's left. And the tenant farmers, uh, Matthew 21, 45, which is in our reading today, which is, when the chief priests and the Pharisees heard these parables, they perceived that he was speaking of them. So who are these tenant farmers that are supposed to turn the fruit over to uh, the landowner. Yeah. The ones who were, what, what is their vocation? What are they supposed to do as chief priests and Pharisees and scribes and religious leaders? Bring the people to God. Yeah. And, 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 and what else? Not just bring them, Each but one. keep them. Yeah. To explain to them what these fruits are that they're supposed to give. What does it mean to give fruits of prayer and praise to God and to God alone? They're not doing that. What, what, what God do they demand that people recognize? Themselves. Look at how good I keep the law, right? Be like me. Be a Pharisee. We're the winners. You're a tax collector. You're a loser. You don't keep the law like I do. You're a loser. Yeah, they've raised themselves up in the place of God, as you said. Who's their God? Me. So they're the tenant farmers. And if you look back, uh, well, let's go on here. Uh, we need to find out who the landowner's servants are. And so we've got Matthew 23, 37. Somebody want to read that on the screen? Or Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together 
as a hen gathered her brood under her wing, and he would not. So the, the landowner servants, these are the ones that the landowner sent to get the fruits from these people that God has planted in the vineyard. Who were they? Uh, the prophets. Isaiah. Yeah, the city of the Jeremiah. Elijah. Elisha. All the prophets of Israel in the past. And who was the last prophet sent? Christ. John. John the Baptist. John. Yeah. And what happened to him? He was beheaded. Killed him. <clears throat> Here you go. This, this is very, very topical for right now. And who are they good planning on killing now? The final prophet, our prophet, priest, and king. The son. Because uh, who is the son? Well, John 3.16. This is one of my favorite translations. It's not ESV. Somebody want to read John 3.16 on the screen? God loved the world this way. He gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him will not die but have eternal life. For God so loved the world, so God loved the world in this way. You want to know how much God loved the world? He sent his only begotten, beloved son to die for you and I. That's how much he loved him. Wow. He's the son. He's the son that God sent. God sent him standing right there before these tenant farmers looking for the fruit of faith. And instead, what are they going to do? Kill it. It's right there. Jesus is telling them, this is what is going to happen. But yet, at the same time, they have to kill him to fulfill the prophecy. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the amazing thing about God. But is God, is God taking control of their minds and making them do this? No. They're choosing to do this. They're choosing to kill Jesus. They have hate in their heart for him. And, and do we have to have the whole the, the devil put hate in our heart? It's there. Murderous hate exists in my heart and in yours. Thank God I don't act on it. That's who we are. And that's the wondrous way that God works. He doesn't have to take control of you. He doesn't have to take possession of you and make you do things you don't want to do. He works through your choices even evil choices for his good. He didn't have to reprogram Judas. He knew what Judas was going to do. And that's the amazing thing. And it's really a whole other Bible study. But his foreknowledge and the way he works things out, it's not just, well, I know what Al's going to do tomorrow, so I can say this. His will is done through your choices. Without making you do a single thing, even if you choose to destroy the church, you will fulfill his will. The devil hates it. Devil very much wants each, each one of us to spend an eternity in hell with him. And everything he does to try to tear our faith away to the working of the Holy Spirit will only serve to strengthen it and keep us in faith. And that's because God is an awesome God. And he works far above the plans of man and even the plans of the devil and demons. And the cross is an excellent example. That was the worst the devil could do. And it was exactly what needed to happen. And God didn't have to tweak any dials. That's just how he works. So do we really ever have to worry? Do we have to, I mean, we should be concerned with what's going on in the world now and all the evil and stuff, but do we really have to worry that things are spinning out of control, especially beyond God's control? No. 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 <clears throat> Doesn't mean we shouldn't pray. Pray that his will be done. He's got a handle on it. And it's happening for a reason. Good. Uh, and then it also mentions other tenants because Jesus said, therefore, I will tell you the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruits. Who are the other tenants? The Gentiles? Yes. Take your hand up in the air like this. Yep. Bring it around and point it yourself. <laughs> Hi, I'm, I'm other tenants. And so are you. Let's read Acts 13, uh, 45 to 46. <coughs> But when the Jews saw the crowd, they were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what was spoken by Paul and violently. 
and Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, saying, It was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you, since you thrust it aside and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. Behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. So this was Paul and Barnabas, and they're kind of describing what they would do when they would go from town to town in Asia Minor. The first place they would land would be the synagogue. And they would preach the gospel to the Jews. Because that's who was supposed to do it first. Not because God loved them more than anybody else, because they were the, supposed to be the light of the world, the witnesses to the Gentiles. So Paul and Barnabas came and it's like me coming to you and say, here, here's the gospel. I need you guys to help me go out and tell them. And I'm telling you, not because I love you more than them. I love everybody. But you're my soldiers, my foot soldiers. And what did these foot soldiers chosen by God in the synagogues, how did they react? Put their backs up. They refused. And so at that point, Paul says, you're on your own now. I've given you the gospel. You know what? You're lost. I'm going to take it to the Gentiles because they need to hear it. And they're the other tenant farmers that God was going to call in because they will produce fruit. The Jews today, except for the Messianic Jews, do they produce any fruit for the Lord? No. Even though they attend synagogue every Sunday, they're not producing fruit. They think they are. But by not recognizing Jesus, they are lost. Any other final comments or questions? I, I do want to come back to the, uh, when we meet next week, the stone that the bell was rejected. There's some neat things to talk about there, uh, but we don't really have time. So that's our little teaser for next week. Anything you guys wanted to mention that you hadn't mentioned already? Good study? Yeah. Are your heads spinning? No, but twist all the way around and no one can guess. <laughs> a lot of good stuff here, isn't it? And, and where is Jesus teaching this? Do you know where he's at? <coughs> he's in the temple. Remember, this is uh, the Passion Week. It's probably Tuesday. And he is in the temple. And he's really got limited time to speak to these Pharisees, Sadducees, and, and religious leaders before he dies and rises again. And so he's making one latch ditch effort to get them to repent. And knowing that it may not take now, but these things that he's teaching them, do you think after the resurrection, as, as uh, Karen said, do you think they might come to mind? If you look at Acts, there are Pharisees that join the church. And they're the ones they struggle a little bit with what is the place for law keeping now and circumcision and all that, how it remembers. They struggle with that, but they're there. Yeah. Good start. I love these. I love the parables, especially the great. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I confess I am one of those sons that sometimes says yes, but doesn't do it. Thank you for the grace and forgiveness that you give me. Heavenly Father, I at times don't produce the fruit that you want me to produce. And I'm thank, so thankful that when I realize that, you forgive me. May that grace and forgiveness be alive and well and working in each one of our lives. Help us to be fruit producers. And when we don't, because we're not going to do it perfectly, may your grace and forgiveness and, and the way that you lift us up when we're broken, may that heal our hearts and our minds and be the power behind us going out and trying again. And, and the wonderful thing is you've given us a Holy Spirit so when our actual fruit production is lagging, lagging and, and not what it should be, your spirit makes up for it, especially when it comes to sharing faith and love of Christ with others. Continue to do that work in our lives, both of us individually and as this church, that we might be a place that encourages one another in the love of Christ and shares it with our fellow man as a church and as individuals. Bring us back together again next week to continue to study this gospel and bring us together again this Sunday to receive all of the wonderful gifts of grace, forgiveness, and eternal life you have to give us. In Jesus' name, we pray all these things. Amen. Amen.
Thanks, everybody. Joe, I didn't have a chance to ask you about that pad at home. Did I? Did you have anything written down? Well, not today. Okay. Still waiting. Okay. All right. Maybe we'll Bye, see you Jill. tonight, huh? Bye, Joe. Bye, Joe. Bye.